the Ukrainian AI community used to create, develop, and educate for a shining future. But then Russia ruined our peace. We switched to a new reality. We do our best to defend our country. The brightest AI minds came to share knowledge with us. Together, we will build a technological and secure future. Peace in Ukraine equals peace in the world. Support Ukraine. Support the AI community. So welcome, welcome to AI for Ukraine. It's a series of workshops and uh, events like lectures from the best worldwide AI experts. We do it to support Ukrainian tech community and support Ukrainian people. Thanks to you and to your donation, uh, we raised more than 300,000 grimas a couple of weeks ago. We passed these funds to the most uh, known phone in Ukraine uh, called Come Back Alive. But please, go ahead, keep going. Support us, please donate to Ukraine. We need to support our people. We need to support our army. Ukraine is fighting for the freedom. Ukraine is fighting for the whole world right now. And Ukraine needs your help. So my name is Yana Mikhailenko. I'm director of engineering at Trinity. Trinity is a tech company. We ensure um, integrity of academic research and education. What we do, we find similarities in students and research works. A lot of folks know us as a plagiarist checker, but we are not a plagiarist checker. We find similarities in work. I manage uh, different teams distributed across the globe, teams from Ukraine, Europe, Americas. Uh, before that, uh, I founded AI startup. Um, it's called Shop by Voice, a voice assistant uh, that helps uh, customers to narrow down their search results uh, during the online shopping. My passion is natural language processing and natural language understanding. And therefore, I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, introduce our talented uh, AI expert today. Um, his name is Yushan Wang, uh, and the topic of today's lecture is Towards Practical Reinforcement Learning, Offline Data and Low Adaptive Exploration. Uh, once he's joining the session, uh, I'm going to present you a tooling that we will use for um, asking questions. You have three options here. The first one is open your browser, type slider.com, use AI for Ukraine code, your name and email, and here you go. You can ask questions. The second option is uh, to use barcode that you can see, right, QR codes that you can see right now on the screen. And the third one is to use, link, uh, to use a link under the video that our organize, organizers put uh, in YouTube. So um, I have a sample question for you. Let's, do, uh, let's use this tool together. What resources uh, you read, watch to discover the most exciting news about AI and machine learning? Go ahead, don't hesitate to answer. Once you're answering here, uh, results will pop up, so you'll see um, what our audience reads. Uh, and it's time uh, to introduce our uh, speaker, Yushan Guang, and I will start with his short bio. Uh, he is a faculty member of the Computer Science Department in the University of California, Santa Barbara. Prior to joining the University of California, he was a scientist at Amazon AI in Palo Alto. I'm in love with the city. Even before that, Yushank uh, was at the machine learning department, uh, was with the machine learning department in uh, Carnegie Mellon University. I had the pleasure of being jointly advised by Stephen Finberg, Alex Smola, and others. Actually, Alex was the one of the first speaker uh, at this project, so you can find uh, his lecture about AutoML as well. Over the years, Yushan Wong has worked on diverse set of problems in the broad area of statistical machine learning, including trend filtering, different, uh, different uh, differential privacy, subspace clustering, large-scale learning, and so on and so on. The most recent 
quests include making differential privacy practical and developing a statistical foundation for off policy and reinforcement learning. So I'm super excited to welcome Yushank. Welcome. So happy to have you here. How are you? I'm good. Thank, thank you so much for the introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Um, we see the first results from the review pool. It seems like a lot of folks are uh, just reading Twitter to get news. Uh, but what about you? Where do you read uh, the most exciting news about AI and ML? Yeah, I, I, I get my newsletter from Google Scholar, so I definitely concur with uh, some of the audience. And Twitter is, is now, I'm, I'm on Twitter too. Uh, so mm -hmm. Twitter is now a great source of uh, getting the latest and greatest for people who, who share their research on Twitter. Yeah, so, so uh, in addition to that, I rely on my students to discover great papers that come up every day. And I, I tend to visit uh, the best part about the major machine learning conferences I like most is, uh, are, are the poster sessions. So I visit poster sessions and talk to the actual authors. So that's, that's the best way of uh, uh, actually learning uh, what's, what's, what's going on in my field. I can disagree with that for <laughs> sure. Uh, hearing news from the people, real people and authors is the best that you can have here. So uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to pass a word to you. Uh, just letting you know that I will come back here for a Q&A se session. So audience, please be active. <coughs> ask our speaker interesting question. Do not forget to upload the most exciting questions. So we will have a chance to answer them for sure. And do not forget to donate. You have a link under the video. See you and good luck. All right. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, uh, it's my pleasure to talk about my research at the uh, AI for Ukraine. I think this is a great initiative. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, so so the, the top topic of the day is going to be on reinforcement learning. So in particular, we'll talk about offline reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning with, uh, with low adaptivity. So, so first of all, what is RL? So reinforcement learning is one of the uh, most uh, useful and one of the mo most general settings in machine learning where uh, um, where an, an AI agent learns to, to uh, interact with the world uh, and, and learning how the world works and learning how to behave in the world so as to maximize uh, his or her long-term benefits at the same time. So, so, so this is a combination of learning and control um, through through the feedback of the environment. An agent takes an action and receives a immediate reward and also the next day that you transition into before you decide and maybe update the policies that you decide to take your action uh, for, the, for the next time around. Reinforcement learning uh, is arguably the, the hottest topic nowadays in machine learning. Uh, in particular, um, we, we've seen the um, We've, it can be used in, in, in many, many different places. We've seen this uh, AI uh, breakthrough in AlphaGo and AlphaZero, uh, all performing the best human uh, Go player. Uh, we've seen reinforcement learning being used in uh, learning how to walk and learning how these joints and bodies work together from scratch and, and to use it to solve games and um, getting these robotic snakes to climb over a wall and so on. It is really the hottest topic uh, nowadays in the machine learning research community. Uh, it's even uh, more popular than deep learning uh, as of 2021 in this major machine learning meeting called, called NeurIPS. Um, on the other hand, like despite the popularity of reinforcement learning in the research world, uh, the real life application of reinforcement learning to, to, to some persistent problems that we face as a, uh, as, as, as a people, uh, so like like energy, uh, like the climate crisis, and so on, like education and healthcare, um, is still very limited, uh, despite uh, the the promise that has been shown in in these recent uh, technical advances. And part of the reason is that reinforcement learning agent um, require re requires having access to an an environment where the agents can can trial and error. Um, and, and try out different things and see if it works and then uh, uh, maximize the uh, cumulative reward on the fly. So, so this requires the agent to explore the environment freely and potentially update the policy every step of the way. 
right? But such exploration is often costly, unsafe, and illegal. Uh, for, in, for, for example, in the self-driving car uh, setting, if we're trying to learn an agent to drive itself, um, then it is uh, uh, the, 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 the standard online reinforcement learners will have to try different options and to really drive off road to receive a very large negative reward to, 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 to know that it is a bad idea. Right, so you can see like how uh, uh, th this is often like not feasible in, in practice. Um, in, in reality, in, in most of the practical applications where RL is appealing, uh, so in a min minute I'll, I'll get to concrete examples. Uh, when when will RL be useful? And my answer will be most of the times. Um, we 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 are not starting from scratch, right? So this agent would have already gotten. Um, sometimes a very large data set that are collected by the previous version of the decision-making system. So this, this could be an automated decision-making system or just human making decisions. Uh, and then we keep all the data of uh, the human's interaction with the world uh, in, in, a, in, in a big table, right? So there are some already deployed system and we collect a lot of data already. Uh, and then, then one may ask these natural questions, can we learn decision policies um, for the future uh, without uh, with, without interactively um, like taking actions and and uh, in the in the in the actual uh, uh, task environment there are two typical tasks uh, in uh, the offline reinforcement learning so one called OPE or offline policy evaluation where the goal is to evaluate uh, the value of a fixed policy so so suppose I'm in a company and uh, I, I develop um, a, a new machine learning algorithm, which gives me the best prediction for for uh, the the best movies that each user would would enjoy, right? Then then on the on my data set, it outperforms everything else. Uh, then I talk to my manager, uh, like, should we just ship it? Should I? Um, I uh, it, it shows promise, but on the other hand, if I decide to use this policy, then it's actually changing uh, the it's actually changing the distribution um, that that the that the users will will see. Uh, so 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 in that sense, it might may or may not be a good idea uh, to to just directly deploy this new policy. Instead, we need something that's surer. We want it to be able to to maybe try replaying this policy on the data that we've already gotten. Uh, to understand how 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 well it performs, right? So I'm using this uh, uh, VPI to uh, to denote uh, uh, the ex expected total reward that the agent would collect if we we run this policy pi like throughout. The the other task in offline reinforcement learning is called offline learning, where the task is to identify a nearly optimal policy pi hat um, directly from the the offline data. So this is like I'm I'm playing uh, I'm I'm just watching my cousin playing Super Mario. I've never played it before, but then by by just looking at him him playing, I learned a a, a thing or two. But at the end of the day, uh, the moment I I take the joystick, I wanted to play even better than him and and achieve the best possible performance in playing Super Mario. Right. So this could be a, a very interesting task, but you can imagine it will also be very challenging. So for instance, if my cousin never really reached the uh, the second stage of the game, then I'll never be able to learn anything about the second stage of the game. Okay, so, so we'll see how we can deal with that in today's talk. Uh, so let me give, give you a few uh, concrete examples of why offline reinforcement learning might be useful. So in the, in the healthcare domain, uh, we, we got uh, loads of uh, medical records, for instance, electronic healthcare, uh, e e electronic patient data. Uh, we've also gotten this person-generated health data like, like step counts and other things you collect on your Apple Watch uh, or iPhone. Uh, and sometimes this data contains patients getting treatment and we can actually observe the eventual outcome of the treatment uh, in a, uh, after a few weeks and after a few years. The reason why we can't directly apply reinforcement learning to this problem is is because uh, like it's just unethical and illegal to to trial an error on actual patients uh, using policies that's given by by the online RL, right? So this is a reasonable setting for offline reinforcement learning to to excel. So in this case, OPE would mean to to evaluate the new treatment plan that a doctor uh, or or a drug company uh, came up with. 
Um, and, and the problem of offline learning is to try to improve over the existing treat treatment plan in a data-driven way by learning a better uh, sequence of uh, treatment to use to cure uh, a particular type of disease. Okay, let me give you another example. So, so in the uh, task of learning self-driving car, uh, learning a self-driving policy, um, so even though uh, in most of the uh, most places in the uh, in the world, uh, autonomous vehicles are not approved to be in action, uh, like oh, like they're, they're never they're, they're they're not even near to be uh, uh, getting all the policies to 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 work out for them. On the other hand, uh, and because because of this reason, we cannot really uh, test the autom autonomous drivers uh, by just just shipping them by, by just asking them to, to roam on the street uh, together with uh, uh, with the, the human drivers. On the other hand, uh, we, we can actually run these vehicles um, by asking a human driver or an engineer to test it and so that we can collect all the data that we need to measure the vehicle state and driving decisions and we can observe the safety metrics and next days and so on um, by um, loads of data from human driver. Right, so, so in this situation, uh, the offline policy evaluation will be to somehow replay the data that's collected where the human is driving the vehicle to evaluate the self-driving algorithms. And um, the kind of problem of offline learning is how do we just use the data and bootstrap from this data to learn safer and more efficient uh, self-driving algorithms. Okay, so, so, so hopefully these two examples convince you uh, that uh, uh, offline reinforcement learning is pretty relevant uh, for practical applications. There, there are loads of other applications of offline reinforcement learning, for instance, in ads and reinforce, uh, uh, in, in recommendation system. It's somewhat risky uh, to the company's bottom line uh, and is ri also risks losing users if we just run online experiments, right? And recommending things that are completely uh, irrelevant to the, to the user's interest. Uh, on the other hand, there, there, there are a lot of offline click-through data that, that already, they already exist from previous systems, and offline RL helps us to, to, to start learning better recommendation system that takes into account of this uh, decision-making perspective of as a recommendation um, by using historical data. So in, in and there are also applications in new material discovery. So in this case, it is easy to parallelize the experiments by running one fixed policy, but it's difficult to have many iterations, many policy updates. So so we we we've been working with material scientists at UCSB uh, and grapple with some of these these problems in in developing say a new material uh, that satisfy like certain. Uh, strengths and uh, um, uh, functional properties. Uh, in addition, in computer networking, we can think about uh, uh, running reinforcement learning agents on network devices like uh, routers and switches. And the decisions that these network uh, devices are supposed to make are bandwidth allocations to different uh, um, dif dif different users and different uh, different applications. Uh, and, and as end of the day, uh, we can measure the quality of experience of uh, uh, human beings using the computer network uh, for, for, for everything that we do nowadays over the internet, right? And, and, and for this, uh, it's easy to monitor the network and collect the data about the network decision and their consequences, but it is difficult to, say, deploy this uh, experimental uh, reinforcement learner to, say, the UCSB's campus website, uh, campus network. And, and risk uh, um, like just bring everything to a, to, a, to a complete failure. All right, so, so um, before I get into the technical details, I also wanted to, to give a slightly broader view of offline reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning in general. All right, so, so let's consider a few other typical machine learning tasks as you might uh, have seen people doing. Say in the first example, uh, say uh, hospitals need to, to uh, decide whether to, to test a patient or not for certain infect, uh, infectious diseases. And the test is somewhat expensive, so they need to be cautious on who to test and who not to test to minimize the risk of spreading, but also like saving in terms of the cost of such a test. Right, um, and and one one may think about using machine learning to do it, and we can clearly train a classifier based on the historical records of people visiting the hospital and and who who, who are considered uh, to to receive a test. 
um, say if the temperature is higher than the 19 degree Fahrenheit, uh, in that 99 degree Fahrenheit, then, then maybe we should test this patient. Um, and yeah, we can we can train such a classifier, and and the developer did it, and, and it turned out that the accuracy is really high on the holdout set, All right? So this is a standard practice. So maybe we should just ship it. So another example is that suppose a tech company wants to improve their user experience on a uh, email service, and then they train a large language model and fine tune on their user data to complete the synthesis of this email, right? So this is a very convenient feature and seems to be working great on all the examples that the engineer tried out. So, so should we just uh, uh, ship it? So what could possibly go wrong? So, so there, uh, we are, we are like really using the, the best machine learning practices. The issue is that uh, every machine learning problem is actually secretly uh, a control problem or a reinforcement learning problem. So, so in the in the first case, uh, if I test patient using the new rule, then the distribution of the patients receiving the test will then be different, right? But but the machine learning models require uh, like is only guaranteed to generate uh, generalize to uh, new data points that that are coming uh, which has the same distribution. But now the distribution is different. And it's not no longer covered by the statistical learning theory. Then should I still trust my classifier to give me as accurate an answer that's reflected on the holdout set, or not? And and in the second example, I suppose I deploy the new guess what you will write prompt, uh, and the users will enter. Uh, um, the users may just enter whatever I suggest them to do, right? So so this changes the distribution uh, of what the users would have written. Uh, and and maybe I get like really uh, great user feedback, but is this model really limiting the creativity, or is, is this model really fulfilling its own prophecy? Right. So so it, it suggests something, and the users will end up taking it. Uh, if the users are more likely to take it, then then my model is predicting accurately. But like, is that really uh, the fair way of evaluating the performance of the model? So the ultimate goal in almost all these machine learning tasks is not for prediction, but to, uh, in some sense, minimize or maximize a certain performance metrics, right? And 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 in some sense, uh, um, prediction and building supervised learning model is one way that we can use it uh, for for downstream tasks for decision making, and 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 this is the tasks that are. Um, reinforcement learning is designed for. So, so from, from this perspective, every machine learning problem, provided that you want to make use of it uh, in, in, in real life applications, then it becomes a decision problem. And the idea is that we better handle such decision making perspective of uh, deploying machine learning models using, say, control and reinforcement learning tools. Okay. I hope that that convinces you that this is an important topic that uh, and it justifies its recent popularity uh, in the research community in machine learning and and there is a like very strong need of developing methodology uh, algorithms and uh, uh, applications of all offline and online reinforcement learning to practical applications. So in the remainder of the talk, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the technical progress that we've made. Uh, on some of these interesting settings on reinforcement learning from offline data. So I'll start from that, and, and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, about a slightly different setting, which in some sense interpolate the offline reinforcement learning and online uh, reinforcement learning and get the best of both worlds. All right. Um, so recall that um, this is a problem setting. So we have some log data. We want to evaluate the new policy or, or identify the optimal policy, right? So, so uh, the first thing that I wanted to tell you about is uh, why can't we just directly use the supervised learning form, right? So we have this state and action and the reward. Why, why can't we just use the state and action to predict uh, the reward and get over visit, right? So um, before that, uh, like, uh, let's, let's, formally set up the problem and let me introduce a, a couple of notations. Uh, so, so in most of the talk, I'll be considering the simplest possible case called a tabular setting of uh, reinforcement learning under this uh, Markov decision process models. Um, and, and we use SAH to denote the number of states action and, uh, and the time horizon. So this is a number of actions that you need to plan into the future. And, and we have uh, uh, offline data trajectories of size n 
And the transition dynamics is denoted by PT and the expected immediate reward is denoted by RT. And the policy, uh, since this is a timing homogeneous setting in, in the sense that the transition kernels and the expected reward can be different uh, for, for each time, uh, then, then the policy will have to be uh, non-stationary as well. So, so each policy, when I write pi, uh, then this is really a tuple of pi one to pi h. Each one takes one decision at a particular time step. And the, the, the and the policy. So this is already deployed system that collects the data for me. Is usually denoted by mu, and the new policy is denoted by pi. Right, and and then then the value function, the standard value function, v function, and q function denotes the uh, the expected cumulative reward that I will receive if I start from state S or if I just start from state S and take action A, right? And, and in this lower case, we denote the expected value of everything, like average over the initial state distribution, right? So this is really the right notion of a, a metric of measuring the performance. So this little, little v pi. Yeah, just just one one more slide about notations. So so uh, what does a data set? What what does one data point in the data set look like? So this is one episode of the data in the form of uh, SAR, SAR, and SAR, right? So so each data set can be written as a state action reward and next state uh, where uh, the action is taken by a particular policy and and the state uh, is follows the, the the Markov decision process is a transition model. From one state to the next, right? So you can think about you're controlling an agent to uh, in in a in a grid world in a game environment, say a Pac-Man. Then you're you're taking the the uh, uh, actions on the joystick to go up, down, left, and right. So as an illustration, suppose you have this agent. Uh, you are at the initial state, and you decide to take action, which takes you down downhill, and then you receive an immediate reward of R1. It gets you to state S2. Right, and then you take action A two. It gets you to the next state, and you continue until uh, if you plan your sequence of actions strategically, uh, and then it'll get you to 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 some location, so some good state where you receive a gold nugget, which denotes a reward that the agent receives. Okay, so let's hope that explains the data. Um, now, now, so let me tell you a, a bit about why offline reinforcement learning is different and significantly more challenging than just supervised learning. So after all, in supervised learning, we're trying to deal with the same task, right? We're trying to predict accurately. We're trying to minimize the, the, the loss, right? And in reinforcement learning, we're trying to maximize the reward. And in both cases, we have IID uh, samples from um, certain distributions. Right, so why can't we just uh, do supervised learning for offline reinforcement learning? The key idea of supervised learning uh, and the key reason that it works is really that we, we can try, we can hypothetically try out other, say, classifiers, other decision policy pi. Uh, um, but but the, the thing is that um, like even that, uh, like uh, we can try out other other pi and, and directly get a good evaluation of uh, what if I've done something differently. Right. So, so in reinforcement learning, the key challenge is that, is that even doing just that uh, is is difficult. So, so why why is that? So maybe let's let's try it. Right. So in supervised learning, it's very straightforward. So we basically replace this pi with something else, and then we can still use the same um, like empirical average to evaluate the actual uh, risk, actual uh, expected loss for the new new policy. But in reinforcement learning, suppose we start with uh, with s. And then take action A, right? And and the, we want to evaluate the new policy. This new policy would, would take the same same action A. So so at least this part I can still do it. But for the next step, like my login policy took action A too. Yeah, but my new policy tells me that I should take a different policy that takes this agent down, right? Then suddenly I don't have any data to tell me like which state that this agent will transition into. Right. So suppose suppose I try to evaluate a different policy that behaves differently from my login policy. Right. So so it is all these uh, hypothetical possibilities that the agents could have ruled out, could have visited uh, that that's not observed that makes this uh, uh, even just an evaluation problem for pol uh, off offline reinforcement learning like very challenging. But for the moment, like suppose we assume that we can solve the offline policy evaluation problem, and then um, I. I guess we can then use the same idea 
of uh, supervised learning to do some kind of uniform con uh, convergence and uniform evaluation on all possible policies, and then try to maximize the 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 the, the evaluated value for this uh, uh, for, for, for this agent. Okay, so so to, that that gives us some idea of. Uh, of solving offline learning and offline evaluation at the same time, right? Using the same principle of empirical risk minimization. Okay, so um, so what are some 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 uh, first ideas of solving this offline policy evaluation problem? So um, re recall that uh, uh, the key, the main fundamental challenge of offline reinforcement learning is that uh, there is this distribution shift from. Uh, the policies that you use to collect the data and the policies that you're trying to evaluate, right? So, so what we can do actually is to uh, is to do some kind of a weighted averages of the reward that I receive, right? So if I just divide uh, the average by the probability of my uh, login policy taking this action and multiply with the probability of the uh, um, the, the, the my target policy taking this action, then then I can I can come up with a unbiased estimation for uh for evaluating the new policy, right? So this seems to be a pretty good idea. So it's standard in, in importance weighting, and this is also known as inverse propensity score in the causal uh, causal inference literature. And and the Sutan Barto, who wrote the Introduction to Reinforcement Learning book, recommended using this uh, trajectory-wise importance weights, which uh, gives the probability, uh, measures the discrepancy of the probability that your target policy and your uh, and your be, uh, behavior or login policy taking a sequence of actions, a one to a t, um, and, and we can we can really just replace this w t with this and get away with an unbiased estimator. But what could possibly go wrong? Right. So, so the issue of this approach is that it suffers from this, uh, something called a curse of hori planning horizon. So if we need to plan way ahead um, for many sequence of actions, and, and each one of them is some random variable with some probability, and we have a product of that on these weights. Right? So, so you can imagine that the variance of this estimator will grow exponentially as h gets larger. Right, so 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 not not great. So the planning horizon, say for so Super Mario, is something like maybe a hundred seconds uh, forward, maybe two hundred seconds forward, and it is really difficult to do that kind of planning when you have an exponential dependence on the on the planning horizon h. So so the first algorithmic idea that we came up with is to actually uh, somehow marginalize this important sampling by using a different importance weighting. Uh, procedure. So, so what what we do is the following. So maybe we can estimate uh, the state distribution that's induced by uh, the target policy instead of just directly reweighting uh, over the trajectory wise importance weight. So what we can do is to uh, to 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 look at all my data and estimate uh, the uh, and then try to try to replay the data and then try, try to estimate the induced uh, state action visitation. Right. The first one is easy. We simply take the uh, empirical averages because this it is has nothing to do with actions. For the second one, we can use the standard importance weighting approach to 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 estimate the state action visitation for the second step, and then we can repeat the process and then use um, like uh, individual importance sampling. And notice that this is fine; it doesn't give you like big variance because importance sampling not only depends on a single discrepancy measure of. Uh, of taking this action A2 to be different values, right? So, so each individual one of these uh, uh, important sampling approach for estimating the state action visitation distribution of the next step um, is actually not too bad. You, you don't have like very large variance. So if we just repeat this, then we can get the um, um, contemplated or estimated state action visitation under induced by policy pi uh, throughout the entire trajectory. And then we can plug in to the important sampling using the weights of uh, uh, that, that are marginalized over the rest of the data sets. This turns out to uh, help us to avoid the curse of horizon and get a, a polynomial um, uh, error bound uh, with a polynomial variance that, that depends on H. So as a matter of fact, uh, our results on this uh, off policy evaluation problem is, uh, uh, is optimal. It's, 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 optimal in a very strong sense. So, so under the Markov decision process model that we talked about, so, so let me like very quickly parse this bound for you. 
So on the left hand side, what I'm showing you is a, a mean square error of my estimated uh, policy value using this estimator called uh, tabular uh, MIS, so, so mar mar marginalized important sampling, and this is a ground truth. So, so uh, on the right hand side, I have this standard one over n rate of mean square error going to zero as the number of data points gets larger. And, and, and the remaining complicated stuff, so these are um, like, in some sense, uh, uh, the, 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 the trace of the inverse Fisher information, the inverse Fisher information of, of, of the problem itself. So, so this is really the asymptotically optimal uh, estimator that achieves the best possible uh, error for estimating the value of a new policy. And we can see that since it would make sense because it depends on how much discrepancy uh, that, that the behavior policy and the target policy would, would give you. And so, so the discrepancy will show up in the bound. And the nice thing about this bound is that it depends on every instance of every pair of behavior policy and target policy we try to evaluate. And the, it depends on the specific variance structure of a particular Markov decision processes. Right, so it, uh, it is tight, tight in the constant asymptotically. So as n gets larger, this really um, meets all the optimality criteria. Uh, um, it, it is really like the, the, the one estimator that you should be using if you have a, a bunch of data for any, any, in any, almost any circumstances. If you simplify this a little bit, right? So the MIS idea like really would give you uh, like dependence only on H square rather than exponential in H, right? So this overcome uh, what we call the curse of uh, curse of horizon. Uh, there's there's this this parameter that is important, so uh, so called the little dm. So so this is what we call a uniform coverage uh, condition, which measures uh, um, the 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 uh, like how good that your behavior policy is exploring the space. Uh, uh, so, so if the behavior policy is not visiting certain citizen actions, it becomes very difficult for us to uh, say anything about uh, about that particular state action in terms of how much rewards that we we'll end up getting for that state action, right? So, so this is a very limited uh, assumption, but arguably like, it's not something that we can overcome in this setting of offline reinforcement learning, right? So, garbage in and garbage out. If your behavior policy is not exploring anything, then there's very little that you can learn. So the same bound also allowed us to um, obtain an optimal bound for offline learning via what we call a local uniform uh, um, uh, of, of, of policy evaluation. So what we do is basically uh, use the same empirical risk minimization by trying this out for every possible policy and then choose the one that achieves the maximum empirical value, right? So it turned out that uh, using our trick, we can obtain also the, op uh, the minimax optimal, uh, mi minimax optimal rate for optimizing the policy. So the one that I output from this algorithm pi hat is nearly the optimal policy as n gets, as n gets larger. And, and all parameters in this bound is, is, is information theoretically optimal. On the other hand, like there's a little bit of uh, unsatisfactory uh, uh, aspect about this offline learning bound. So even though it is minimax optimal, like we don't really recover the variance structure and, and the fine-grained importance weights uh, um, um, that that actually measures the discrepancy between pi star and and mu, right? So so maybe we we can hope to to get something that works even better and gives us more uh, uh, algorithm that adapts to the favorable structure of the algorithm, right? So so this question has been uh, attempted and and considered by by many concurrent uh, researchers in the reinforcement learning community under various different assumptions on exploration. So sometimes it depends on DM. In other cases, it depends on something called a concentrability condition denoted by C star over here in the middle. And, and there are other things that makes it more adaptive to uh, this particular Markov decision processes. The question is, uh, can we get a um, near optimal, per instance, optimal offline learning, offline learning bound? Yeah, we still don't have the full answer, but but we've obtained something that uh, that's able to recover everything that, that's known in the existing literature. So this is the most adaptive bound that you can can get for offline reinforcement learning, and and the, the key uh, like uh, we can see that it recovers this importance weight with a, a behavior of the optimal policy on top and the behavior of the behavior policy, the induced uh, visitation probability of the behavior policy. Uh, in the 
denominator and the variance structure, which also also recovered from our bond. Right. So, um, so, so this is the most, per instance, uh, uh, adaptive offline learning bound uh, that 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 have 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 seen um, up to this point of the day. What what? Um, but but it still doesn't solve the problem when the optimal policy visit states has never seen the data. Right. So so I'll give two answers for this. So the lazy answer is that the optimal policy might not be measurable. So so uh, so in this case, like we simply cannot obtain the optimal policy, and we should just give up. But that's a lazy answer. So maybe in this case, we could still we could still learn something, right? So so it turns out that this idea of be, being a little bit of conservative and being pessimistic in the face of uncertainty is really get us a long way uh, in in solving the problem in the uh, in the much stronger stronger setting. So so the the previous offline learning bound that I've shown you also implies something called a oracle inequality that looks like the following. So what it says is that on the left hand side, this is a performance of what I get from my algorithm. And on the right hand side, right, so I can actually compete with an arbitrary comparator policy pi that's not necessarily the optimal policy, right? So, uh, and, and then, um, and, and then the, the performance difference is, uh, is also bounded by this bound that I was showing you just now, but with everything a uh, pi star replaced by this particular policy pi. So this is saying that if the behavioral policy is not really visiting, not having good coverage, then we can still do something. We can still compare with uh, say other policies that are better than my behavioral policies that's in the local neighborhood, right? That's in some sense uh, is actually covered by my behavior policy. Then, then, then I can compete with that and then do, do just nearly as well. Right, so this is something called an oracle inequality, and what we are minimizing is a regret. And the thing is that we don't really need to know which which pi we are competing against, and we can simultaneously compete with any other pi that's that's out there. Right, so so with this model, learn as much as we can and identify the best policy identifiable. So in the context of medical treatment, this is saying that oh, I I don't really want to get all the way to the optimal cure to the cancer, which arguably we can't with the current data, but we can already improve the current practice in treating can cancer patients significantly by by just doing uh, by just changing uh, very mildly and and explore those uh, uh, treatment options that has already explored and then try to optimize uh, within the subspace. Um, even that, like, is is not a very satisfactory solution to 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 many practical problems because, um, like, it still require like this logging policy and target policy to, in some sense, visit the same state and actions with certain probabilities, right? So if any of the useful state actions are not visited by this meal, then you suddenly get a, a vacuous bound on the on the on the right hand side for for all the meaningful policies that's that's on the left, right? So the question is, how can we do better? Um, so, so, so I'll illustrate this point with this example of using reinforcement learning for Pac-Man. Uh, so let's say that uh, um, like the, this layout of this grid uh, and uh, where every agents are and where the, the, the pellets are, so this denotes the state of the, of the game, right? So, so uh, in the, any real, real life applications, we always, almost always have an exponentially sized state space. So having any dependence as polynomial in the state space is, uh, is not great. Right. So in this uh, in this setting, so the learners may may discover that that uh, uh, this the left hand side uh, state is a very bad state to be in because you are about to die. But but this says very little about the the, the other state where this Pac Man is also trapped within uh, between two ghosts. Right. So it is just as bad a state as it is. But we can't really learn anything about the second state. Suppose all the exploration data t only uh, tell us about uh, uh, the, the the first state. We can't even do anything, like even if there is an irrelevant part of the, uh, the, the, the this pellet got, got removed and, and we still cannot learn anything because every state is just a, a completely new thing that the agent will need to see again and again and again to actually learn anything, right? So, but, but it's kind of silly, right? As a human beings, we, we do know that there are some information that we can learn from the first one that inform us very strongly on the second and the third kind of state, right? So we need somehow to generalize across the different states so that we can handle an exponentially large size of state spaces. So that brings us to the idea of functional approximation in reinforcement learning. 
and 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 we can actually featureize the state representation by measuring it uh, using a, a feature vector of numerical values. So 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 on the left, I'm showing some uh, options, right? So this is a key trick of getting reinforcement learning to scale, uh, including for solving some of the AI milestone, like solving backgammon and self solving the game of chess, right? So it really need functional approximation, but the, but. Uh, uh, and, and the most popular functional approximation is what we call the linear functional approximation, where we learn this weight uh, that takes a linear combination of all these features that we can uh, help the agent a bit by constructing and use them to describe the state. Right? So it turns out that this idea of being a little bit more pessimistic uh, in the face of uncertainty also works for linear functional approximation. So this is featuring my, my great student Ming's work. Uh, so under the setting of linear MDP, so we can obtain the same oracle inequality, uh, which uh, which which measures the performance difference for any pi. So so now we have a lower bound of the performance of my method under the the the, the functional approximation setting that has no dependence on the size of the state space, but rather it just depends polynomially, actually with optimal dependence on this uh, dimensionality of the feature vectors. And in the middle, this complexity is now uh, like a particular norm of the distribution of this feature vector that's induced by the target policy, uh, like under a norm that's described by uh, the covariance matrix of state action visited by the login policy. So, so now all we have to do is that the login policy um, visit every direction uh, that's possibly uh, spanned and have a good representation of the subspace. Uh, that that the target policy is in, and, and and then we can we can have very strong offline learning bound using just offline off offline data without uh, having access to the environment. Okay, so so the, the algorithm is least square value iterations if uh, with a pessimism and variance revading. So so if you are familiar with uh, RL literature, and this is one of the standard algorithms that people actually use in in, in practice. Right, so. Um, so as a, as a checkpoint, so so far I've told you about offline uh, reinforcement learning. I've covered a couple of uh, technical results uh, that try to use a, a, a theoretical canon to address the practical problems. Uh, it's still a very young field, and there are a lot of opportunities for, for new theory and applications uh, um, like in, in this domain. So, so one thing that I'll, I'll also mention is that these two algorithmic block, MIS and pessimism, they're also used on the empirical side of offline reinforcement learning too. So MIS was further developed into the family of DICE methods, which does distribution correction uh, by directly estimating the visitation probability of a different policy. And the pessimism is one of the most uh, popular approach and design principle for algorithms that works at the state of the art for empirical deep RL research with uh, with offline data, right? You see, see some work by Sergey Levin uh, and and other folks at Berkeley. Okay, so um, in the remainder of the talk, I'll give you a very quick uh, summary of uh, the second research topic that we 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 uh, uh, the the a slightly different setting called reinforcement learning with low switching costs. Um, so 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 let's let's get to it right away. So, um, so, so why, why do we need this? So fr from the theoretical study and the empirical evidence that, that online reinforcement learning and offline reinforcement learning, they have very different characteristics. So I'm comparing the case in the finite horizon, finite action setting. So in an online RL, like we don't really need to assume anything. We can algorithmically strategically explore the space and obtain bonds that are independent to, to the, the uh, like makes no assumption of how the data is uh, coming about because we're actually deciding like how to how to how to explore the space. On the other hand, for offline learning, so so this DM parameter is some somewhat uh, uh, unsatisfying as we've seen. So even though we we uh, like we we have good solution to that, so either we assume good exploration or we weaken the goal so that we no longer want to compete with the, with the best policies out there. We no longer want to identify the optimal policy but reduce to the kind of task of policy improvement. But but maybe we can do we can do something better, right? So the online RL can be thought of as a, a an agent having t rounds of adaptivity. And and you can you can change your policy after every iteration uh, after ob uh, observing the outcome, 
But offline reinforcement learning in this point of view is that we only have one round of, of adaptivity. We can decide which data, which policies that we use to collect data, and that's the only thing that we can do, right? We, we can't really update that and to collect new, new data points. The thing is that in practice, we do have a little bit of access to the environment. It's not that um, running experiments is, uh, is completely a taboo, right? So we can actually go over the approval processes with FDA and IRB to actually conduct data. So even though it takes time. So, so maybe there's something between uh, that we can, we, can, um, we can design to get the best of both worlds, right? So, 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 so uh, there, there really is, and the setting is called a reinforcement learning with low switching costs. And, and instead of getting the offline data in one batch, so now we have say key batches where we can collect new data and decide the new decision policy to use to collect the data, right? So the, the question is that can we solve exploration uh, uh, and obtain the same sample complexity bound as seen the the uh, as seen the previous problems while with a small number of policy changes. Okay, so so a, a quick summary uh, um, it, is that uh, we show that this is possible in the NeurIPS nineteen paper. We show that we can get away with uh, uh, just using a logarithmic size switching cost while obtaining the optimal regret, uh, a near optimal regret of the square root of t, uh, where t is a number of steps or it's number of episodes that you can you can design for exploration but k is the number of times that you change your policies uh, and more recently we've solved uh, the problem with even stronger guarantee we show that uh, it is sufficient and necessary to uh, to 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 change your policy for only log log t times right so this is iterated logarithm like for those are not uh, um having a good idea what log log t is about, if you take the entire number of uh, entire universe and count the number of atoms in that, and then pass that into log log t, and the kind of number that you get is between 10 and 20, right? So, so this is really like a, a constant uh, in for, for any practical applications. So um, so why, why does switching cost matters? Um, I've briefly hinted at this. Because in, in practice, usually it is not uh, collecting new 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 data that's uh, costly. It is the deployment of a new policy for, for data collection that is costly. So we cannot afford to refresh the firmware on all the Tesla cars uh, that are running um, every uh, after every turn, after every every day. Uh, we, we can it is much cheaper to just face it and schedule uh, the experiments in parallel while uh, just updating the policy only once in a while, right? It is uh, um, uh, also very very expensive to 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 test and to pass the IRB approvals and to run the actual uh, experiments, say in the A/B testing, in all kinds of settings, uh, and and all of these will take time. So if uh, we need to run an online reinforcement learning algorithm, it's really infeasible. Right, so low switching cost is a desirable property. So it, it also in cases when we have a lot of uh, computational resources uh, in parallel, so we can scale up experiments arbitrarily in uh, on using cloud computing services nowadays, but we cannot really run them uh, sequentially uh, where, where the next experiment to run depends on the outcome of the previous experiment, right? So having low switching cost also helps us to scale up um, in terms of the computational complexity. So um, our approach of uh, using, uh, uh, doing low switching uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, involves an algorithm that uh, needs to solve exploration differently, right? So, so most existing approaches for, for strategic exploration in RL uses the concept of optimism in the face of uncertainty. But, but, but uh, like for that, we cannot get better than log T switching cost. So what we can do uh, instead is to, 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 to schedule uh, one policy to run using techniques from experiment design and, and break down the exploration into, into several phases. We first do a very crude layer-wise exploration um, by, uh, by getting a ballpark approximation of the model, right? And now that we have a model of the world and then we can try to use it to identify representative policies uh, using uh, techniques from optimal experiment design. And then we can leverage the data that are collected from these running these policies. And after every phase, we basically try a policy elimination and disqualify those policies that are 
already certifiably suboptimal and then continue, right? So it's a uh, it's a, a kind of a policy elimination algorithm that we can we can use. So so uh, so graphically, if we have a policy space to begin with, and then after k uh, rounds of uh, uh, experiments, we're now uh, we're now over over here. And and we know that we can we can show that the optimal policy is always going to be trapped inside this uh, subset of policies. Um, so what we can do next is to use experiment design to identify a few, in some sense, basis functions or some representative policies for us to do uh, the, the 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 exploration for the next phase. And then we basically collect data using these in parallel batches. And at the end of the day, this helps us to eliminate the new policies and eliminate uh, a bunch of other things that are suboptimal, right? So, so, so that, that's the idea for the algorithm. It's uh, somewhat interesting, um, but, but what, what we can show is that this is nearly optimal simultaneously in both the kind of regret, so this in terms of square root of t, and also in switching costs. And we pr also prove the information theoretic lower bound which says that no algorithm with square root of t regret can do better than our, our algorithm, which switches the policy by HSA times log log t times, right? Yeah, so, so this really settles this uh, theoretical question. And, and then uh, the subsequent task is to, to, uh, to come up with practical algorithms in the functional approximation setting to, to, um, to solve exploration. And, and then it becomes like truly, truly practical. Okay, um, so so um, uh, it is a still open problem, and we are actively working on it. How to do low switching reinforcement learning in the functional approximation setting, um, but but this is a, a very promising direction, uh, research direction uh, in offline reinforcement learning. As a summary, um, so I've I've told you about the importance of handling the decision-making aspect in your machine learning practice. So, so you, thought you you didn't get anything technical from this talk. I, I hope this take home message uh, of real life uh, application of uh, machine learning, whenever we need to use a prediction for doing anything requires us to think about the consequences and the, think about the counterfactuals of uh, the deployed new predictive policies. Uh, and, and one way that we can handle that is through reinforcement learning techniques. Right. I hope that that message would be clear to everyone attending this session. Uh, and and I, I've told you a bit about our research on offline reinforcement learning and showed two uh, algorithmic techniques called marginalized important sampling and pessimistic uh, pessimism in the face of uncertainty that has that very interesting properties that in some sense address the issue of the poor coverage from the offline data. Then in, in this new setting of reinforcement learning with low switching costs, I've uh, mo mo motivated the setting and told you the first algorithm that achieves the, the information theoretic limit in, in solving exploration, but still uh, retain deployment efficiency or rather switch a policy with, with just almost a constant number of times. Um, in, in, in the future, um, I guess these are some promising uh, future directions that we have like a little bit of clue, but we, in general, we don't know how to how to address. So, so how do we get a regret minimizing reinforcement learning uh, agent with also low switching costs? Like, what is a, a switching cost complexity uh, uh, like in in among reinforcement learning algorithms that 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 actually explores? And what are some new algorithms that are needed to solve this problem? Uh, and 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 in practice, often the offline data uh, and the low adaptive exploration. Uh, uh, are available to to the designer and to to people who develop the application. So so we may well just combine offline reinforcement learning and low adaptive exploration. So at the moment, I'm I'm just dealing with them separately. But maybe what we should do is to not just give up uh, the offline data and, and but rather try to use it and to reduce the variance and so on and use it as a launch pad so that subsequently in the online reinforcement learning the agent can be safer and and more more efficient. Uh, finally, uh, I've talked about uh, uh, pessimism, which works with the offline case. And then we've talked about policy elimination, which uh, it, uh, works to solve exploration in the online case. 
but but the pessimism might not be compatible with efficient exploration at all, right? So so the the question is, uh, so this is more of a technical question, and whether we can get pessimism, which has a nice features of staying safe always. Uh, whether that is compatible with uh, solving strategic exploration in any reinforcement learning model, right? So all of these are completely open, and I I, I look forward to 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 seeing research work that are coming from the Ukrainian uh, research community uh, on on these interesting technical problems. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Awesome! Thank you so much. It was really exciting to hear about uh, your approach to practical reinforcement learning. Uh, it seems like we have a couple of questions from our audience now. So let's start with the most popular. Uh, Victor is asking, um, is it only my impression or reinforcement learning is evolving slower than uh, deep learning, meaning an architecture and its application? If yes, why is that? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a very good question. Uh, so in the past decade, we've seen an explosion of deep learning techniques in um, uh, in, in solving um, ma many of the practical AI problems in vision and language and so on. Yeah, uh, and 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 it is uh, it is a consequence of the exploding um, availability of computational resources and data, right? So 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 I I I would argue that the the um, like reinforcement learning and deep learning, they are they are not directly like we're not directly comparing apple to apple, right? So we can apply deep learning techniques to reinforcement learning and use it for the functional approximation. So I talked about linear function approximation in my talk, but what what actually solved AlphaGo? What what really solved the the, the game playing agent is to use a deep neural network to approximate the Q function. Right, so 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 you can use the neural network and then leverage the same amount of data and computation and use them for solving reinforcement learning. Um, part of the reason why reinforcement learning is getting more popular much later in the much later phase than 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 the standard deep learning for supervised learning is because I I, I think supervised learning nowadays are more or less solved and there are more interesting problems and there are more interesting promise for the decision-making perspective of, of, of machine learning nowadays. So, so that, that is why like, people are more only more recently switching gear to, to handle reinforcement learning by tapping into the, the, the entire decade of uh, technical, technical growth and availability of computer, uh, computing resources uh, um, that, that led to uh, the, the breakthroughs in deep learning. Right? So, so um, in short, they're, they're not contradictory to each other. And, and deep learning is helping reinforcement learning to solve more challenging problems. All right. And next one is from Bogdan. Uh, can those policies be problem agnostic, like add an optimizer, one for all problems? In which cases would they vary? Uh, yeah, yeah, good, uh, good, good question. Um, yeah, so, so uh, reinforcement learning will require a little bit of modeling of the world. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, uh, any methods that works out of the box without modeling the world. Um, so, so I would say that the, the, there there is something called model free reinforcement learning. But even um, even for that, like we need some kind of a model assumptions and realizability um, that, that their function class for approximation is sufficiently large uh, for for the for the method to do well usually. And the key reason is uh, that we need the Bellman uh, Bellman equation to be true, which which is a uh, a key uh, key reason why we can avoid the curse of horizon. Um, optimize in terms of optimizers. There's a a, a different a type of reinforcement learning called the called policy gradients, called policy gradient methods, uh, which effectively is stochastic gradient descent. You can do the Adam version of uh, Adam or or SciSGD or other grad version of the policy gradient for reinforcement learning too. I sus suspect it has already been done. Um, but uh, yeah, from the optimization point of view, like that's that's definitely doable. All right. It seems like we have a really challenging question. So, what do you think is the best way to vectorize real life human environments and not cheaply and not to cheaply create a simulation for offline learning of agents? Uh, yeah. So it requires a bit of uh, creativity and uh, understanding of the particular domain. Um, uh, an alternative would be to take whatever features that you have, say the raw features like images, uh, and then pass it through 
uh, representation learning layers and then try to learn everything end to end. But of course, like one is uh, requires, uh, if you want to do everything end to end, it requires a much uh, uh, um, bigger amount of data for, for the algorithm to be successful. But, but if you have a good idea of which good features to use, you can always concatenate that with the end-to-end -end learn feature so that your, your, your method is already doing something that's interesting, even if the, the uh, uh, deep learning based features is, is no longer, uh, it's, it's not, not yet like uh, at, at, its, at its best, even, even if you only have a very limited exploration data. Okay. So what is the most challenging task in the reinforcement learning field currently? Yeah, this is a big question. Uh, so in reinforcement learning, so uh, function approximation uh, is one of the biggest topic. And how do you avoid the dependence on the, the state space while still allowing the, the agent to learn exploration? Uh, so, so this applies to both the online and offline and low switching case. I would say that uh, uh, in the offline, uh, in the offline case, uh, the, the the third question that I posed, uh, can we get away with both pessimism and uh, uh, and and solving exploration? Uh, so so that's one of the uh, major open 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 challenge uh, uh, open challenge as well. But 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 like but seriously, I, I think what what we are really missing are applications of reinforcement learning and offline reinforcement learning. We have built a lot of techniques, and, and what what uh, researchers can can help. And to to uh, can, can help doing is take take this theoretical insight to design algorithm and then solve the real life applications. I think even having just one or two applications uh, uh, is uh, that, that are successful uh, will, will help the theoretical development as well. Uh, and and for us to 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 target our like algorithmic power on on, on problems that that really matter. Right. So so from my experience, I discovered this on offline reinforcement learning and the uh, uh, low switching by just looking at applications, right? And and these are the data that are required by the applications. Uh, without this, it, it can't possibly be applicable to those applications, right? So so both solving uh, strong, uh, challenging technical questions and uh, taking this to 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 practice and then to crack these open problems. All right. The next one is from Natalia. In reinforcement learning, some machines learn to optimize the reward without actually performing the task it was designed for. What solutions are there to prevent this from happening? All uh, right, right, right. So, so this, this is this is a very good this is a very good question. Um, so, so the, the 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 machines are designed to optimize the re reward that. Uh, um, yeah, it depends on where the reward is coming from. Like suppose I as a designer, so I'm incentivizing this agent to to maximize a particular metric, uh, then th it is a metric that it, is, it will be maximizing, right? In, in other cases, when these uh, rewards are observed uh, in the unknown environment, say the reward will be the patient's outcome, right? And we can measure how good the patient's outcomes are. Then, then the agent can uh, just learn to maximize the, uh, say the, the Percentage of people recovered from uh, from from this 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 treatment. On the other hand, like uh, just maximize in the in, in practice, a lot of the uh, problems are more complex. There are multiple di dimensions. Say uh, we we want safety, uh, and and also um, um, like we we don't just want the reward. And if we we blindly optimize a particular metric, uh, it may lead to policies that are unusable in practice. Say. The best policy for solving cancer might be to just explore all the combinations of different drugs uh, uh, exhaustively for all cancer patients in the world, right? This helps us to identify the optimal treatment policy, but it might not be the best thing to do. It's definitely not the ethical or legal things to do to, to, uh, for, for the patients themselves, right? So, so, so I, I think it, it is a like, good research direction to, to somehow solve the multi-objective reinforcement learning. So currently, I, I don't know of a very good work in this domain. Right, and so the next question again from Natalia. Uh, as a machine gets creative in reinforcement learning, how can we tell the difference if it was a glitch or if the AI is showing new way to perform this task? Uh, right, yeah, this, this is a bit hard for me to answer because uh, um, yeah, in, in most uh, such RL applications in particular, you might have seen this uh, hide and seek video on YouTube. If you haven't, I strongly encourage you to. Uh, 
Um, so, so sometimes it really discovers interesting strategies, right? So this is a game where a group of agents is learning to hide and another group of agents is learning to, to find uh, other agents that are hidden uh, in, the, in the environment. Right, so 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 the agents learn various interesting uh, strategies uh, uh, that that humans would think of that are physically plausible, but the RL agent also learns with enough training data to actually exploit the bugs in the physical simulation engine, so that they can do things that are like not feasible and not relevant for for practical robotic systems. Um, so 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 I think it really depends. It has a lot to do with how we formulate the problem and how we parameterize the. Uh, the policy space. If the policy space is something like a decision tree, then it is more interpretable compared to suppose it is a deep neural network, right? So, so depending on the applications, uh, so one may pre prefer one versus another. All right. Yes, it could be a glitch. Then. Oh, we have a question about uh, reinforcement learning and deep learning in the future. So thank you for interesting talk. Can you see or feel if there are some seemingly unexpected fields of mass that can find application in reinforcement learning or more generally in deep learning in a few years? Uh, right, that, that's 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 a good question. Uh, so so as you can as you have seen from my talk, uh, I, I work mostly on statistical machine learning and the foundation of machine learning. So mathematics uh, and and, uh, and probability theory, linear algebra. Uh, and, and all aspects of statistics play a very significant role in, 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 my, in my own research. There's a big community, uh, in, in a big sub-community in the machine learning and AI uh, uh, community that, that, that focus on these problems. Uh, and, and we do draw the mathematical insight from, from, um, from everywhere, um, from, from math, from statistics, uh, from, from functional analysis, and, and so on. Uh, so, so it, it's it's not something that that happened only only recently, um, and it has been uh, the mathematical foundation of machine learning has been with the develop of the machine learning from the very beginning. Uh, so, in the next few years, I I would definitely predict that uh, there will be more theoretical understanding on how deep deep learning and deep reinforcement learning work in practice. Um, but uh, this is complementary to the uh, equally exciting progress of uh, empirical researchers in machine learning who just try to come up with new algorithms and new ideas and try them out on applications to get things to work, right? So the theory and then the mathematical foundation uh, often comes a little bit slower, um, like it takes maybe a decade or so before it, we can explain the theoretical success. On the other hand, sometimes uh, the theoretical insight from um, doing a more mathematical flavor of re, uh, machine learning and AI research can help us to uh, predict what are the things that are likely to work well and what are the regimes that, that methods are uh, expected to fail, right? And, and one, one uh, good example is the development of boosting. So Ada Boost uh, uh, by uh, uh, Rob Shapiri and, and, and uh, Yuha Fond uh, is, is the most powerful method, uh, XGBoost, that solves almost 90% of the Kaggle computation challenges, right? So it is still the most popular algorithms out there, and the development is completely theoretical driven, right? So I'd say that it is a very healthy dynamics between the empirical and, and the theoretical researchers in the machine learning community right now. Yeah. So if you have something to contribute, uh, and, and for maths, and something that I uh, yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to see, and uh, I'd love to to talk with you offline. Yeah, please reach out to me in an email. Awesome. So it seems like we have some requests for uh, papers. What should I read? What papers to learn how to use pre-trained neural networks to help the agent to find the best reward? Like using CNN to detect objects to help the agent to learn driving skills. Uh, right, right, right. This. Uh, uh... Fine tuning and pre uh, pre uh, pre training and fine tuning split is uh, the main paradigm in the in the in the, um, uh, in, the, in the hottest topic in the AI world now. And people are training foundation models and then try to use the foundation models for a lot of tasks. And reinforcement learning is one of them. Uh, so so I'd say that it is still in the early stages of such development. But I, I would encourage you to check out work by say uh, the the AI AI lab in in UC Berkeley. And some of the work down at the uh, Emma Bronskio and, and others in Stanford. Uh, so so they uh, they they have uh, some some interesting uh, experimental results on using foundation model for reinforcement learning. 
Also, the latest and greatest on RL, uh, and in particular deep RL, we, we often have um, workshops at the major machine learning uh, meetings like NeurIPS and ICML, and they are available. Uh, they are often not just an offline event; they are also uh, sometimes available online virtually. So, if you can physically travel to the conference, you can check out the the website and then then see the available uh, Zoom option for attending attending these these workshops. Yeah, I think it's a very promising direction. Um, so, so for instance, the foundation model in CNN will help us to plan and optimize reward better for anything that involves images, right? So when the state is described by the images, this is really the natural thing to do. And when the state is described by uh, for text, for instance, maybe we want to learn reinforcement learning, use reinforcement learning for a chatbot or for a, uh, um, uh, for, for a, um, like, uh, like, a. uh, uh, restaurant recommend uh, re restaurant booking booking system, right? So this involves interaction between the agent and the humans, and the state is al almost always described by the the transcript of the text. So in this case, using a, a pre-trained foundation model for text like BERT, Roberta, and others, or GPT three will get you a long way and give you like semantically meaningful state representations that can later be combined with a. Uh, uh, with with the say Q learning or even pessimistic Q, Q, uh, Q, uh, least square value iterations uh, for for subsequent processing and that will significantly improve the sample efficiency uh, for for reinforcement learning agents. Awesome. So I will use my privilege as a moderator of this session today and ask my own question. Uh, so we have uh, a pretty big audience, a lot of people are from Ukraine watching these lectures, but we have also have people from Canada, Europe, and so on. And I'm curious how these people can become a part of your research group or can contribute in the work that you are doing right now. Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, so I... Uh, I, I take one or one or two students every year, so PhD students. So, so if you are interested in working with me, uh, yeah, please, please submit an application to through the UCSB's Computer Science uh, uh, PhD program website. Uh, and and I, I I do also collaborate with people, uh, uh, like without a formal ad advisor advisee relationships. So, so if you are uh, if you have a, a good idea uh, that that you want to talk about and get my feedback on. Uh, please reach out to me. Uh, I, I can't guarantee a fast response, but I will get back to you. Uh, and 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 yeah, catch me at conferences. And I'm happy to uh, to 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 talk to. I'm happy to 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 talk to you about uh, what what's going on in my lab and uh, uh, yeah, and to learn what what you've been up to. Thank you yeah. so much. And and you uh... can interact with me on Twitter. Awesome, awesome. So we, we also have uh, your profile at uh, AI4Ukraine.com site. So folks, please go and uh, find Yu Xiong Wan, um profile so we can reach out to him. Uh, I want to say huge thank you. You can see a lot of folks uh, just saying thank you. It was so exciting session. Thank you for supporting our people, our community. I, I think that you will have alliance of people that would like to reach out to you and do some cool stuff with you. So wish you all the best. Hope to see you on this stage again. Uh, all right. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure. Pleasure to have you here today. So guys, I hope that you liked the session as much as I did. Next week, we're going to have again a new event. This time, we're going to have um, a lecture from Maria Antoniak. She's a PhD at Cornell University and young investigator at Allen Institute for AI. She will share her knowledge on uh, modern personal experience shared in online communities. And to help our organizer, I would like you to share your feedback. Please take 10 seconds of your time and run uh, and vote. If you like the session today, uh, we really appreciate your feedback. We'll try to improve. Um, and do not forget to donate. See you next week. Bye-bye.